why it's called grace, right? Last week was Easter Sunday, and uh, if, you don't, if you weren't here, I used an illustration of a ladder and, to, and talking about climbing the ladder of goodness to try to get our way to God, right? That, that we need perfection, and, and the reality is none of us are perfect. We can't climb the ladder of goodness to get to God, to get to heaven, to get to perfection. And, um, and just like that video, uh, all of us, all of us are imperfect. And um, we're in that series called No Perfect People Allowed. I'm glad you joined us. This is the last of the, the three messages that we have in this series. And the reality is, I am not perfect. Can we all claim that? Can we all say that loud and proud? Ready? Here we go. I am not perfect. We're not. And, uh, and you, you better not pretend you're perfect when you come to the cross. Because God sees right through it. See, we're, we're, we're looking at what it means... Um, uh, for what Christ has done for us, the power of the cross, the power of forgiveness of our sins. Just, just like in that video, when we get to see God face to face one day, there will be an account. We'll have to keep an account and give an account for what we did while we lived on this planet. And in that moment, it's either going to look like that. It's going to look like um, not, you didn't measure up, or Jesus is going to come alongside and say, oh, no, this, this one's mine. I paid for their sin. And they're in, right? And so we're going to continue talking about that a little bit this morning. And um, I just want to say thank you for giving me some grace this morning. I really don't feel that great. You know, those times when it's a Sunday and you don't feel good and you're like, man, I just don't feel good. I, I don't think I'm going to go to church. Anybody have one of those Sundays? That was me this morning, but I had to come to church, right? Like I didn't get to sleep in and just be like, oh, I'll just watch it later this week or whatever. Oh, wait, I'm preaching it. So I better be there. Um, so pray for me, because my throat feels like it's about the size of a peanut right now, and uh, I know God gave me strength to preach very clearly the last sermon, and I know that He has something for each one of you in this room, and I'm not willing to give up on that message that God has for you this morning. Um, last week was Easter, and I tell you, last week was awesome. I mean, last Sunday was awesome, wasn't it? And uh, just for those of you who call New Hope home, we've got something cool to celebrate, because last Sunday, 17 people marked B on their Connect cards saying that they're starting a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's awesome. <laughs> Now, you guys did a little better than the first crowd. They, they did more of a golf clap, right? And it's like, hold on a second. When one person accepts Christ, we know that in Scripture, the angels throw a party. God, it, that's what he's about. And that's the only number that matters to me is those that say, do you know what? I know I need Jesus, and I want him in my life. And if you haven't taken that step yet, maybe you're like, you marked C last week. If you weren't here last week, A was, I'm already a Christian. B was, I want to start a relationship today. C was, I don't know yet. I'm just investigating this stuff. I, I don't, I'm not sure yet about it. And maybe that's you this morning. You're kind of like, I'm here. I came with some friends, or I'm here, and I'm just curious. That's awesome. I'm glad you're here. My prayer is that you'll hear something from God this morning, specifically for you. Because um, I tell you what, almost every Sunday I hear people leave, and they grab me, and they say, Tim, when you said, and I'm like, I don't remember saying that. It's because it's the Holy Spirit saying it to you and speaking to you. And I want to allow him to do that this morning in all of our lives, okay? Um, so, so let me ask you some questions as we start uh, this, this message this morning. In, in a little bit, we're going to be in John chapter 21, and, and we'll get there in just a minute. But have you ever been in a season of your life where, where all of a sudden you, you have an aha moment or a realization that you are somewhere where you never intended to be? Meaning you, you at one point had a purpose in your life, you felt clarity, and then all of a sudden you found yourself with absolutely no clarity in a place that's actually dangerous. And, and a place you're like, how in the world did I get here? I don't know if you've ever been there. I think all of us at some point in our life has been there, right? Uh, it's kind of like the movie The Lion King. Anybody ever seen The Lion King, right? All right, show of hands. Um, the Lion King, man, Disney's... Uh, Disney movies, you know, this was back when I was in high school, The Lion King came out, and um, I remember watching it in the theater for the first time, and if you remember the story, there's, there's the king, that's Mufasa, right, Mufasa, it's all these cool words, and uh, what's the monkey, the little monkey dude's name, I forget his name, okay, anyways, I'll let you say it, so that moment, you know, right, right, where they, ha they have the Simba, you know, the, the baby, it's like, I don't know what they say, but like, right, there's that, that great moment, now there's a prince in the kingdom, and so Mufasa has his son, the prince, that one day will become the king, and it's so cool at the beginning, and you feel like, wow, this is really cool, the circle of life, right, all that stuff, I can't sing right now, so forgive me, um, and there's this moment in the story 
where Simba gets himself in trouble, and his father comes. And his father's coming trying to help, but what ends up happening is Mufasa dies. I'm telling you what, you're in a theater full of a bunch of kids watching a movie where their dad dies. Come on, Disney, right? How cruel. How cruel is that? Um, but I'm wondering, with, Muf- with, uh, with Simba, what does he do next? Right? Simba has this right to, to become king. He was born into it to rule over, right? And so he had position. And in this moment, uh, Simba doesn't run towards that. He runs away, doesn't he? And he runs away from all of what his purpose was into something that is lesser than. It's not bad, right? He goes and finds some friends. Kuna Matata. And they have some fun. And, and one of them has gas all the time. I mean, it's, it's hilarious. Um, but there's this point where all of a sudden he realizes his purpose wasn't where he was. And something was different in him, right? I think so many of us connect with that because that's our story. We, we've been in a season of our life where we found ourselves miles away from our purpose. I mean, like, just wh- how did I get here? I mean, what, how did I find myself right here where I am at? At one point in my relationship with God, I, had, I felt possibilities, and I felt, I felt a call, and I felt a deep relationship. But in this season, it's like you hit those spots where, like, he's far away, and I'm far away from who I am, like who I thought I was going to be. Something happens in those moments. And I think a lot of times people settle there. They set up camp in that land, living outside of their purpose. And they get themselves busy. And they think, there's no way I can go back to whatever that circumstance was, or the failure that I experienced, or the running that I did, or whatever it might be. And, and there's this sense of, like, I guess I'm just here. I'm here now. This is where I'm at. I'm just going to accept it, and I'm stuck where I'm at. I'm telling you, this morning, we're going to learn something quite different than that. Because I think that's what the enemy says. You're stuck. And here's the question we're going to answer. This is it. What does God think of you when you are an absolute failure? Welcome to New Hope. Great question, huh? <laughs> that's a joy bringer, right? Like, like who, what does God think about you when you are an absolute failure? When you can look back and see that crossroads and you got miles away from your purpose, what does God think of you? Because I'm, I'm going to be blunt with you guys. Some of you believe an absolute lie. And that lie has become such a truth to you that it is how you operate now in your relationship with God and your relationship with other people. That lie is louder than the truth. And this morning, I'm praying that you get set free from that lie and that you walk into the truth that we're going to learn about Jesus, who he is, and what he's done, and why he's done it. And we're going to learn about this character by the name of Peter, okay? So let's do that. Let's turn in our Bibles, okay? Every week I ask you to bring your Bibles. My voice keeps getting deeper and deeper. Turn to your Bibles. <coughs> it's going to be freaky here in a minute. All right. Um, let's turn to John chapter 21, okay? John chapter 21. And uh, if you don't bring your Bibles, I say bring it. Um, you can download our app, our Bible app, our New Hope app. All of it has the Bible on it. And uh, in John 21, it's the last chapter, right? It's, right, it's after um, Jesus has risen from the, the, the dead, and he's conquered death, and, and, um, and he's shown up a couple of times to his disciples and to a bunch of other people. And we're going to see a scene here with this guy by the name of Peter. Now, you guys know, in, in the past, I, I, I tell you how much I love Peter. Because Peter's that disciple that gives me hope, right? Peter's the kind of guy that, like, he's like, okay, I'm going to— um, I'm going to shoot, aim, no. See, I'm on, I'm on cold medicine, and so it's going to be, some of you have been around New Hope when Tim's on cold medicine. You have no idea what's going to happen sometimes. <laughs> Seriously, it's going to be fun. Um, ready, shoot, aim, right? That's, that's Peter. He, his brain doesn't catch up as to his mouth. His mouth starts going, and he's like, whoa, and, he, and he, he seems so many times to get it so right, and then the very next moment, he gets it so wrong. And that's why I love Peter. No perfect people. I mean, Peter is it in the Bible. I mean, not perfect at all. There's this moment where um, Jesus is hanging around with his disciples, and Jesus is asking them, after he's walked with them, he's lived with them, he's camped with them, he's, they've seen him do miracles and, and all sorts of stuff. All of a sudden, he asks his disciples, says, hey guys, I don't know who, what all they think. Who do you say that I am? And it's kind of quiet. It's like that awkward Sunday school moment where you think you have the answer, right? Like, and, and, and so Peter, like, finally says, you are the Son of God. You're the Messiah. 
and he gets it right. Jesus is like, you are absolutely right, Peter. Ding, ding, ding. Gold star sticker for you in Sunday school, right? Like, like wouldn't you feel good if you got the answer right when Jesus was on that asking you the question? Whew, I got it right. Awesome. And that's what, that's what Peter did, right, in that moment. Like, celebrate. Like, how good would he felt? And then, and then shortly after that moment, Jesus is starting to tell his disciples what's going to happen to him. And he starts to try to explain to them that he's going to get arrested, that he has to die. And, and they're like, what is he talking about? They didn't understand what he's talking about. And then when he, as he's saying that, Peter like goes, no, 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 God. He's like, Jesus, no, I will not let that happen to you. Never. And just moments after he got the superstar sticker for the right answer, then Jesus looks right at him, eyeball to eyeball, and says, get thee behind me, Satan. Ouch. Right? It's like, I got the, ooh, ow. Wrong answer, right? And, um, and so Peter, he had those moments where it was like, he, he had the right answer, and then he just, just flubbed it up big time. Aren't you grateful for Peter? Because there's hope for us, right? <laughs> like one of his disciples. Um, <clears throat> look farther down. The night that Jesus was betrayed, Judas, Judas had already left. And he had already went and told the religious leaders where Jesus was. He collected the money from them. And Jesus knew what was about to happen. And he goes out into the garden to pray. And he asks his friends, he's like the disciples, hey guys, why don't you come along with me? Stay here and stay awake with me and pray with me. So Peter and the other guys are hanging out. And, and Jesus has one request, stay awake. What do they do? fall asleep, right? Like one request, just stay awake with me, guys. I know it's been a long day, but just stay awake with me. And they can't do it. Peter can't do it, right? Until the moment happens when, when the soldiers come to arrest Jesus, and they're awoken to what is going on, what is happening right now. And, and, and they're coming to take Jesus, and then Peter is like, no way is this happening, right? So Peter stands up, and it says he takes a fishing knife, because he's a fisherman. He takes his fishing knife and he cuts the ear off of one of the guys that's trying to arrest Jesus. Duh, right? Like, there's, a, there's some things in that, in that scene that just crack me up. One, one of the other gospels say that they had swords. They had a couple of swords. It's like, why did you grab your fishing knife, dude? You're trying to kill somebody, right? Like, common sense. But he grabs his fishing knife, and he wasn't trying to cut off an ear. He was trying to kill this guy, taking his friend, taking his Messiah. No, I'm not letting this happen. And Jesus has to be like, what are you doing, Peter? Knucklehead and... Duh, and then you get, sorry, and he heals the guy, puts the ear back on, right? Like these are comical scenes in scripture where it's like, that really happened. Oh my gosh. And he kind of like rebukes Peter, you know? Like, don't, don't do that. And so they arrest Jesus and they take him to the city. And, and it says that Peter and John, Peter and John follow behind at a distance. Because they don't want to get caught up in this. They don't want to be arrested. They're just like, what are they doing to Jesus? And they go into the city. And, and most of you know this part of the story with Peter. Because moments before, when they were hanging out in the upper room, the last meal they had together, Jesus looked right at Peter and said, Peter, you're going to deny me three times before the, um, before the rooster crows. And he's like, no, I would never do that. Never. Jesus so they're falling from a distance. They see where they are taking Jesus, and Jesus is not being treated well, right? He's being abused. He's being whipped. He's being beat, and they're watching it, and imagine being Peter. The emotion that you'd be experiencing in that moment would be fear. My whole world is being torn apart right now, and I don't understand what's happening. A servant girl who is there, and it's dark, comes up to him and is like, wait a minute, aren't you with him? Aren't you one of Jesus' disciples? He's like, no, 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 no. That's not, you got the wrong person. I'm not with him. It says later, he's warming himself up by a fire. And that fire is really important. We'll get back to it in a minute. He's warming himself by a fire with some of the other servants. And it says one of the relatives of the guy who got his ear cut off <laughs> is around that fire and looks at him and goes, wait a minute. Aren't you with, aren't you with him? And he says, no, no. You got the wrong guy. I'm not with him. And the third time somebody says it, he goes, no, I'm not with Jesus. And in that instant, cock-a-doodle-doo, the rooster crowed. 
his eyes point at Jesus' eyes. And imagine the shame that just came over Peter. I just failed. I just denied him. I did exactly what he said I was going to do. Talk about a moment of failure, right? That's Peter. That's one of his, Jesus' disciples, Peter, making the biggest mistake ever. Now, we get into John chapter 21, and we're going to see Jesus and Peter hanging out again, okay? Um, <clears throat> because Jesus died, he was buried, he rose from the dead, and we know that he showed up to his disciples. It says at one time, showed up to 120 different people, right? And then he showed up to groups and to the disciples multiple times. In chapter 21, Jesus is going to show up again and show himself in the risen form that he's alive. And so let's get into this story here in John chapter 21. And I'm just going to story through it. You guys know how I do that sometimes. We're just going to story through it and pull out some truths as we walk along with this journey. And the question we're answering is, what does God see in you when you fail the most? And we're going to see how he actually sees you, okay? So let's, let's jump into it. Everybody ready? Everybody with me? Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be pulling from your energy because mine is continuing to deplete as I talk. So if you guys hear something you like, go, mm-hmm, all right? Like, give me something back. Give me a little, like, amen or whoa, that's good or something. Okay, everybody with me? All right, all right. Pretend that you're not white, okay? That's not a racist thing. I've been in African-American churches that I just love. I love it when the preacher preaches because, man, they are all in it, right? They're standing, they're waving, like, hey, amen, right? You all are just boring. So... <clears throat> So let's pretend, all right? Let, let's, let's get a little energy as we look into the scriptures. I love you guys. Um, so this is what happened. Everybody with me? Yeah. All right. Uh, ooh, okay, here we go. <laughs> afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. What's, what's afterwards? It says afterwards for a reason. After what? After his death, his burial, and his resurrection, right? After all that had happened, and he appeared before some of the others. Boom, after all that happened, now he's going to appear before the disciples by the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is kind of a, it's, it's home territory for these guys, for these disciples, right? This is, this is like home base. It's going back to their stomping grounds. And, and that's where they went. That's where Peter and his buddies went. And, and as they're hanging out by the Sea of Galilee, it, Peter says, he says, I'm going to go fish. I'm going to go out to go fish, Peter told them. And those that were with him said, well, we're going to go too. We'll go with you. Now, this is not a small statement. Um, Scholars have different views and different opinions on this statement. And, and I kind of lean towards this one. Just a second. When Peter says, I'm going to go fishing, it's not because he's bored and it's like, I just want to do my hobby and just go out and have some fun, right? Like, that's what some of you'd be like, I'm just going to go fishing. For Peter, by the Sea of Galilee, this is home base for him. The sea is home base. He grew up as a fisherman. And for him, in the statement of saying, I'm going to go fishing, many of the scholars believe this is him saying, that is where I'm going to be for the rest of my life. I'm going back to fishing. I'm going back to what I know is safe. I'm going back to what I know how to do because I don't know what's going on with everything else, right? Like he, he, he I mean, Jesus showed up a couple of times, but he's still holding the guilt and the shame of his failure. And he, he hasn't had any orders about what to do next. And so he's sitting there kind of like, I don't know what to do next. I don't know what we're supposed to do next. And so I'm going to go fishing. I'm going to go back to what I know, what I'm comfortable with. Going back to my old job. I'm just going to get busy. And just try to distract myself from what I'm feeling. I don't know if you've ever been there. We, where you've walked to that that place that's miles away from where you thought you were going to be, you're like, that point of shame in my life, I don't ever want to go back there. I'm just going to come over here and do what I know how to do. I'm just going to make myself busy. I'm just going to get busy in my work. I, I got to do my job. I'm just going to get busy and distract myself with things I enjoy doing. I, I'm just going to ping pong between busyness and distraction so I can not think about that moment of failure. I don't know if you've ever done that. I think a lot of us do that. It's easier to walk around distracted than deal with reality. <clears throat> I think that's what Peter's doing here. It's like, I'm going back to fishing. Uh, 
I don't, that's where I'm going. And so he does. And the thing is, he doesn't go by himself. Peter was a leader, right? People followed Peter. He was kind of like, he was kind of the guy in the disciples. Everybody's like, what's Peter doing? All right, let's go after him. And so not only did he kind of walk away from God's purpose for him, he took some other guys with him. Hey, why don't you come fishing with me too? Let's just do this thing again. Let's just do what we used to do. And he did. And I need you to understand, when you stray away from your purpose and plan, people are watching, and those who are closest to you are following. Especially parents, right? We got parents in the house. When we stray away, trust me, our kids are watching, and they're going to repeat what we do, not what we say, right? Like, that's the danger. And so Peter here, he's not doing it alone. He's taking people with him. He's like, he's like I'm going fishing. And they're like, okay, Peter, we'll follow you because you're leading us. We're with you. There's danger. There's danger when we move to busyness and distraction and take others along with us. So, so let's see what Peter did, okay? Let's see what these guys did. So they went out and got into the boat. But that night, they caught nothing. They caught nothing. Do we have any fi- people that love going fishing? Just show of hands, people love go fishing, right? Um, have you had, had one of those days where it's like, man, I, I got everything ready. I, like the night before, I prepped, you know? I have all my tackle prepared, right? I've got my bait, the bait that I love to use, and I know I'll catch every time with that bait. I've prayed my lucky prayer, Jesus, give me fish, right? Like I've done all my stuff, and I've gone out to fish all day long, and when you catch nothing, how frustrating is that, right? Imagine Peter. This is his job. This is what he's thinking about, right? I'm going to go back to fishing. Do you know when you run away from God, God just might have a sense of humor and frustrate your plans, right? That's what he does. And he doesn't do it to annoy you. He does it to call you, right? Whenever you, you, you stray away from the path that you know you were going to be on at one point and you go down the southern road and find yourself miles away from that purpose— I'm telling you, whenever things stop working, things kind of get out of alignment, and things aren't lining up the way they're supposed to, I'm pretty sure it's God frustrating your plans because it wasn't his, right? And here's Peter. I think, I'm telling you, Jesus has a sense of humor. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. But I think, I think Jesus was like, yeah, they ain't going to catch anything tonight, right? And so here's Peter and the guys frustrated all night long on the boat catching zil nothing right <clears throat> let's keep reading what happens verse 4 early in the morning so it's been all night long jesus stood on the shore but the disciples did not realize that it was jesus this is where i think jesus has a sense of humor guys they didn't realize it was Jesus. And maybe you could have a bunch of different arguments. Why didn't they know it was Jesus? Maybe they were too far off. They just couldn't see him, right? He's, on, he's, he's far away. And, and we read later, they were about 100 yards out, which isn't super far, you know, out in the water. I'm sure they could see um, a figure on there. So I, I don't know if that was why. Um, some may say maybe it's because Jesus in his risen body still carried the scars and disfigurement from the price he paid on the cross. We know in the book of Revelation, he still has the scars. And so maybe they didn't recognize him um, because he just didn't look like the same Jesus. I mean, these guys, you'd think they would, right? They lived with him. They camped with him. They traveled with him. Like they, they knew Jesus. <clears throat> but they didn't recognize him. I think it, I honestly, look at all the moments after the resurrection when Jesus shows up. I think Jesus is just having a good old time. I think he's playing with his disciples and with other people. I think he's just playing, having fun. Let me give you proof. Some of you are giggling, so let's laugh about this, all right? When Jesus, um, or, or when Mary, so after the resurrection, right, right, uh, Mary comes and is at the tomb, and it's empty, and she is crying because she doesn't know where the body is. She doesn't know where Jesus is, and she's, like, broken. And, and all of a sudden, a figure appears next to her, and she thinks it's the gardener, right? And it's not. It's Jesus. But, like, Jesus is just sitting there, and he's letting her think, it's the gardener. And he asks her questions he already knows the answer to. He goes, why are you crying? He already knows, right? And then he's like, who are you looking for, you know? And then she looks up and says, it's Jesus. And then poof, he's gone, right? I think he's just having fun and playing with his kids. There's another scene, and this one's even, I love this scene. It's, it's called The Walk to Emmaus. 
two of the disciples were leaving Jerusalem, and they were walking a seven-mile um, road to Emmaus. And as they're walking, they're talking to each other about everything that's happened, about Jesus and dying on the cross, resurrecting. I mean, they're just, it's the news of the day in Jerusalem. Everybody's talking about it. Everybody's like, what is going on? And all of a sudden, a stranger comes up beside them, walks with them, and starts asking them questions. And it's Jesus, but they don't recognize him. It says that he hides himself from them. And I'm like, I, maybe he had a hoodie on. You know, I don't know. Like, right? People with hoodies and glasses. I don't know. They just didn't recognize him. And, uh, and it says, as they're walking, he's asking, so what happened? And they're looking at him like, where have you been, dude? Like, don't you know the news? Are you the only one that doesn't know what's going on here in Jerusalem and what's going on with Jesus? And they tell Jesus about what happened to Jesus, right? So they're like, oh yeah, yeah, he died on the cross and then somebody went to the tomb and they couldn't find him. And, and they're like, oh really? Hmm, wow. You know, and like Jesus is playing along. And here's why I think he's joking with them. Because it even says, then when they get to where they were going, Jesus pretended, he acted like he was going to keep walking. And they're like, no, 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 no. Why don't you come and have dinner? And he's like, oh, okay. And so he comes in with him and has dinner. And then as they're eating and he breaks the bread, their eyes are open. He goes, it's me. And poof, he disappears. I think he's having fun. Right? And so those two guys, those two disciples go, that was Jesus. They're like, wasn't your heart burning when he was speaking? Like, why didn't we recognize him? And then they just haul tail back to Jerusalem. They go back up to the upper room, and they're like, guys, disciples, we found him. It's Jesus. He's alive. We, we saw him. We didn't know it was him. And then all of a sudden, while they're in the room, Jesus appears. Even though the doors are locked and everything's locked up, he appears. Poof. I would be a little, right? That's a scary moment. Like, it's like, ah! And Jesus scares them, and he says, this is how he scares them. Peace be with you, Right? Tell me he's not having fun. Tell me he's not having fun. And then the thing, the thing that it says next is like, what? He's like, peace be with you. He's like, oh, is that fish? Can I have some? He's like, he's hungry. He's like, I skipped out on the last meal, but you guys got some fish? I'm hungry. You're like, why is that in there? Why, did, why is that detail even in the story? Um, scholars call this internal proof, right? It's, it's, it, the reason why these details are in the story is because they really happened. Why would we know that he asked for fish after he shows up and says, peace be with you? So I, I see this moment where Jesus shows up on the shore and, and they don't recognize him. I think he's just having fun. And I think we'll see the next things he says. We'll, we'll prove it, okay? So Jesus is there. They don't realize it's him. And so he calls out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? Now, the original, the original language in this, in this passage, the NIV it doesn't do it justice because this word friends, actually the original Greek word there is the word for children. He's calling out to them, little boys, did you catch any fish? That's what he's saying. I'm like, oh, you're having a blast. Jesus, this is hilarious. And, and the, brilliantly, they say, no, right? Like, <laughs> no, we have caught no fish. Imagine their frustration with somebody hollering at them. No, we've caught no fish. It's been a whole night. We've worked our butts off. We've thrown the net over and over and over again. No fish. Thanks for asking. Poking us with that one, whoever you are on the shores, calling us little children. How rude. Right? <clears throat> Y'all with me? All right, all right, all right. Then he said to them, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some and when they did they were unable to haul the net in because of the large amount of fish Jesus is just having lots of fun now I need you to understand something maybe you've heard that have you heard that story before where they're fishing on one side and all of a sudden they cast on the other side and then, whoa there's more fish than we can handle do you know where that is maybe you've heard it here before but in Luke Chapter 5, this was the moment when Jesus called Peter the first time. Jesus loves Peter so much, he's recreating the moment that he called him. He's not hollering at him and being harsh. He's not yelling at him like, what the heck are you doing out there? Why are you running away and fishing? What are you thinking, Peter? It's ridiculous. It's not what he's doing. I think some of you hear the voice of God as this harsh voice 
who points you back to that moment of shame over and over and over again. And that God has this voice of, what are you thinking? Why did you do that? Why did you make that decision? You gotta, why are you so foolish? And some of you, that's what you hear. And I'm telling you, that's not the voice of God. That's the lie you believe. And for Peter, this is a powerful moment where Jesus is speaking something so personal to him. There's other guys on the boat, but this is all about Jesus and Peter. And this is what he's saying to Peter. He's saying, oh, you remember this? You remember this one, Peter? And he's telling him, listen, my arms are still open wide. My son, my arms are still open wide. The relationship is not closed. I'm right here. That's what he's saying in this moment to Peter. Some of us think God's voice is so harsh, but I'm going to say no. I think God's voice is kind and playful. And he invites us back. I don't want you to run away from him. Peter could have stayed out on the boat. Peter had a lot of choices to make in this time of how he was going to respond. Let's see how he responds, right? <clears throat> Verse 7, the disciple who Jesus loved, which is John, by the way, and John was the one that wrote this book, so he calls himself the one that Jesus loved, right? It's like, <laughs> dude, John. But the thing is, he didn't want to say his name. It's like, I, he, it's like, the thing is, his relationship with Jesus was tight. I mean, they were tight. Jesus loved John. And so John said to Peter, it is the Lord. And as soon as Peter heard him say it, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. That's an interesting thing. Usually when you jump into water, you take things off, right? It's like, it's like I don't want to be bogged down. But when you fish, you, you get down to bare minimums, I guess. It's hard work, so you, you don't want to be hot and sweaty. So he gets himself presentable before God, and then he just flails himself into the water. It's like, it's the Lord, and he goes for it. He goes towards Jesus. He heads towards the shore as he's flailing and swimming and running after he gets to the shallow end. <laughs> and in, in this, we see this, and then the other disciples followed in the boat because they think they were smarter. They followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about 100 yards. I, this is the picture in my head, right? It's that, like, Peter's just like, it's the Lord. And he just, and he's, ah! you know, he just goes for it. He's like, I got to get to him. I got to get to Jesus. And the other guys are like, okay, it's going to take us three rows to get back to the shore. And so they start going, one, two, oh, hey, Peter. And then they like pass him on the way to the shore, right? And like Peter's like all in, like, ah, you know, going for it. Um, I don't know if that's really what happened, but that's just, you know, holy imagination in this moment. So they all get to the shore then to see it's Jesus, to see it's Jesus. Now let's see what Jesus does, okay? Because those of us who believe God has a harsh voice, and when, when we come to him in our moment of absolute shame and failure in the past, that he's going he's gonna to poke in that shame. And he doesn't. He doesn't to Peter. He doesn't do it to the rest of these disciples that followed him. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. And Jesus made them breakfast. And this, I need you to see this picture because this is powerful. I didn't learn this until this week, and I'm like, oh, that is so cool. So Jesus is recreating the moment where he called Peter with the whole fish thing. And in this moment, he's bringing them to a fire of coals. Listen to the, it's a fire of burning coals. Now, all through Scripture, there's lots of fires, right? There's lots of different places people start in fires, things about fire, and a lot of words for those. This fire is a very specific word that is used in the Greek. And it's only found one other place. One other fire in all of Scripture is listed as this kind of fire. And do you know where it is? It's the fire that Peter was standing around when he denied Christ. That is deep, guys. He's recreating the moment of Peter's failure before a fire of coal. But he's not shaming him. He's reminding him. He's reminding them. And so Jesus had his own fish. I, I'm thinking if Jesus makes breakfast, it's going to be good, right? Right? The feast 
for eternity. It's going to be good, right? So I'm thinking he didn't just make some, uh, oh, it's the same old fish and same old bread. Like, Jesus made them breakfast, and this is, what, this is his invitation. So Jesus said to them, come. Come and have breakfast. Come and sit with me. Let's hang out together. I don't know who you eat breakfast with, but usually we eat breakfast with our best friends or our family, right? And that's what this invitation was from Jesus. He's like, guys, we've done this a lot. We, we actually have been in this spot by the Sea of Galilee, and I've, I, I've made you fish and bread before. Come, eat with me. And he, and he invites him in. He's basically saying, you're my friends. I don't want to be with you. And then, then we see when Jesus reaches out to Peter's greatest failure. And when they had finished eating, <clears throat> Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, that's his full name. I don't know if your mama has ever called you by your full name. <laughs> Timothy Lee Broughton. Oh, guys, I got to go. I don't know what's going on, right? Like, I'm in trouble. Like, something bad's going to happen, right? Like, when somebody says your full name, and so Jesus is calling Simon Peter. That's his full name. Simon, son of John. Uh-oh. We're getting serious. Do you love me more than these? Now, we don't know what Jesus was pointing at. We don't know what the these were. Scholars have different ideas of the these that he was saying. Do you love me more than these? We don't, Jesus might have been pointing at the fish they just caught saying, Peter, do you love me more than these fish? You think you're going to run away and just go fishing all the time? Do you love me more than that? Or was he pointing at the disciples? Do you love me more than these guys that just followed you to go fishing? Like, do you love me more than these? We don't know exactly what the these are, but what we do know, it's lesser than what Jesus wants, right? He's saying, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. And then Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Imagine being Peter in that moment. By the coal fire, the reminder of why he's asking three times, do you love me? And so it says Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him a third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. This is a powerful moment in Peter's life. See, <clears throat> some of us think Jesus would come to our moment of failure just to shame us. And I don't know if you've ever read this passage before, you know. Um, you can read it with different tones. If you think Jesus was shaming him, it would sound more like this. Dude, Peter, do you love me? Why did you do that? Why did you, why did you deny me? Do you love me? Yeah, I love you. No, really. I mean, you did it a second time? Really, Peter, do you actually love me? Yes. No, Peter, I don't think you get it. A third time, you denied me. And I'm asking you, for real, dude, do you actually love me? See, some of us, when we hear the voice of God, that's what it sounds like when we think about our moment of shame, a point of failure, a, a point where we've messed up royally. And guys, that's not Jesus. How do I know that that's not Jesus? This is what shame does. Do you know what shame does? Shame always points you backwards, doesn't it? Shame always points you back to that point of failure. Shame, shame would be, Peter, you messed up. Look at what you did. Now I'm going to rub your face in it. That's shame. That's not what Jesus does. He doesn't look in the past. Jesus says, do you love me? Then feed my sheep. He looks to the future. He points him forward. He doesn't look backwards. Do you love me? Yes. You know I love you. Then take care of my lambs. Not backwards, forwards. Do you love me? Yes, you know more than anything that I love you. And he says, feed my sheep. Take care of my sheep. Let's move forward. Let's draw a line in the sand of what has been. And right now, let's restore that wound that you would have walked the rest of your life with, Peter. 
that would have left you on a trail miles away from your purpose. And let's, let's dig into that. I know it's going to hurt a little bit in this conversation, but let's dig into that, Peter, so that you can be restored. You don't have to walk into that lie, and you can walk into freedom in your purpose and what I put in you. Feed my sheep, he says. And every time he says it, I mean, I, I think about what Jesus saw when he looked out at the crowds. There's sheep all throughout the New Testament, this illustration of sheep and shepherds. And, um, and Jesus, in this one moment, looks out at the, at the people in these crowds, and it says he's moved with compassion. And that word, I mean, we don't have a word that describes the original word in there. It's like his guts are wrenched by what he's seeing. He's like he's broken because he sees that they are like lambs going to the slaughter, and nobody's there to help and protect. That's his compassion. <coughs> and so he's saying to Peter, look at all the sheep. They're helpless. Feed them, protect them, take care of them. They're mine, and I want you to shepherd them. That's a powerful statement. And man, I look around the world today, it's just as messed up as it was then, right? I mean, look at what's happening in our high schools, in our junior highs, the things that are going on in our world right now. It's not a bright light place. It's not happy fairy tale land. It's like, there's a lot of brokenness. There's a lot of darkness. There's a lot of sheep being led to slaughter. And he's telling us guys, you and me alike, feed my sheep, protect my sheep, take care of my sheep. They're his. And if we walk away from our calling because of our shame, we're missing out on the calling and God's purpose to bring light to shepherd and protect who he's called us to. Let's bring heaven to this broken world. And I don't think he's called any of us in this room for a lesser than life. Don't settle. Don't let shame and failure pull you away from God's purpose. Don't believe the lie. Let's move forward move forward. Do you think this was a comfortable conversation with Peter? I don't think so. I'm sure Peter was wrecked in this conversation. It wasn't easy. He wasn't shaming him. He was restoring him. And sometimes to heal some of the hardest wounds, it hurts. I don't know if any of you have ever had a broken bone. Have you ever had a broken bone before? Um, I've never broken one of my bones. Hallelujah. I don't plan on it either. Um, someday I'm going to race cars. I'll break one then. But <laughs> it'll be doing something cool, right? Um, I've never broken a bone. But my son, Nat, who's sitting over here, he's broken a couple, right, Nat? And there have been times where his bones weren't in alignment. And I don't know if you've ever had to have a bone reset. It's not a fun process. And I know at one point he had a bone that had to be re you know, pfft, put back in place and they had to put him under because it would have caused so much pain in the process of resetting that bone. Sometimes to walk into healing, you have to go right to the pain. And sometimes we feel like maybe God grabs that hurt and it hurts even more when he grabs it, but he hurts it to heal it. Not to hurt it more. And there may be something in your life he needs to grab. And it may hurt a little bit in the process but it's to set you for healing and to free you for purpose. He keeps talking to Peter. And he says to him, Very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went, uh, went where you wanted, but when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. He takes him right back to the moment in Luke chapter 2. Remember the fish, Peter? Now you remember the pain and frustration, Peter? Now I'm restoring you. Now let's go back to the beginning. Follow me. Follow me. And that's what God does. That's what Jesus does. The kind of death that, that Peter was going to experience when he described that was crucifixion, and that's how Peter died. He was crucified as a martyr of the faith. And it's that kind of death would bring glory to God. I'm telling you what, with my life, I want to live a life, and I want my death to bring glory to God. 
whatever it is, whatever he wants, whatever he's, his desires for my life, that my life and my death, all of it together, would bring glory to God. And I just, I think for all of us who are Christians in this room, that should be our desire. But we got to get past some things. And we got to let Jesus grab the wound and restore us. Let's go back to the point of failure so we can get back into the plan of purpose. And this morning, I want to create some space for us to do that. And maybe some of you this morning, this message was for you. God brought you here this morning on purpose for you to hear this message. And he's given me strength to preach it so that you would hear it. And I don't want you to waste it. I want you to respond. If there's something that you've been holding on to, a point of failure in your past, and all it does is just keep bringing you back to shame, you need to tell the enemy you no longer are going to hold this one. I'm letting Jesus grab a hold of this wound. And I'm taking it to him. And I want him to restore me. And you can do that today. You can do that this morning. You know what? <laughs> Maybe some of you in this room think, Tim, but you have no idea what I've done. It was worse than Peter. You have no idea what I've done. How in the world could Jesus just kind of kind of wave his hand over and dismiss what Peter did? How could he even, there's no way he could just dismiss what I did. I need you to hear this loud and clear. Jesus never dismissed what he did. Jesus paid for what he did on the cross. And a Jesus, a God who's willing to pay for it, isn't willing to let you stay in it. He's going to run after you in all love. You hear me? Listen to his voice. God, this morning, I confess our need for you. We cannot die for our own sins and make it right. You sent Jesus, your perfect son, who never sinned, to die on the cross for mine. I don't deserve it. And yet you give it as a gift, salvation, <clears throat> and freedom. And this morning, God, there are those in this room that need to take a step to be like Peter and just flail out of the boat, jump in the water, and just run to you. And you're going to meet them with comfort, you're going to meet them with a peace in that wound, in that frustration, in that hurt. And I know it because you have proven it over and over and over again. Lead us in this time, God, as we respond. We're going to take some time, guys, and we're going to sing a song that I grew up singing this in church. And it's a proclamation as a Christ follower of my assurance in Jesus, this blessed assurance that Jesus is mine. I want you guys to hear this. Are you ready for this? I think, I think with Jesus, I think I'm his favorite. And you know what? You should think the exact same thing. You're his favorite. And he loves you right where you're at. And we're going to take some time to go towards him. We've got crosses set up from a few weeks ago. Some of you responded and said, I need to put some things on the cross and leave them there. And I know some of you, the things you put on the cross, you actually went back to. And again, guilt and shame probably bubbled up in that process. And maybe today you just need to go back to see that word on the cross and remind yourself, no, Jesus has this. That isn't a moment of shame. That's a moment of love. Christ, okay? And some of you this morning, you need to write something down. That thing, whatever it is, maybe something you did to somebody else, that you're like, I don't know how I can forgive me, but I need it. Or something that somebody's done to you. Maybe a, a past why in the road that you took that you feel so ashamed of. And you think there's no way I can come back. 
there are no perfect people allowed at that cross. And he's inviting you. He's inviting you to it. I don't want you to live a life where that thing, whatever it is, just like it could have with Peter, with Peter, that thing, that denial would have been the thing that he filtered the rest of his life through. He would hang out with his disciples. That would be the lens he had on. He would go to a temple to worship. That would be the lens he would look. And I'm telling you, when you walk into this space, for some of you, what you have experienced or done to others or have had done to you, it, it affects the way you see other people. It affects the way you interact with other people. It affects your relationship with God, and it needs to just be done. Jump out of the boat, flail to Jesus, and give it to him. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to sing. Some of you, if you want to do that, it's not a pressure. We're just going to create space. If you want to do that, now there's, there's little baskets on both sides with pens, with small pieces of paper, and little push pens. And I'm telling you, those push pens don't go in that wood very easily for a reason. It's not, it wasn't easy what Jesus did on the cross. And sometimes it's not easy for us to give it back and put it on the cross. But I'm telling you, it's worth it when you fight to get it in. And you release it. And so we're going to take some time and do that. So let's stand together, church, and let him continue to speak. Holy Spirit, we need you. None of this can we do on our own. Our strength is limited. I know my strength is very limited. And yet you call us. You call us out of the boat. You say, my children, my little children, I'm here. You want to comfort us, and you want to grab the wound to heal it. And so as we respond, God, I pray we'd be open to whatever you want to do, and whatever you'd want to speak to us as we sing, as we worship, and as we respond. Let him use this time.